I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. I'm here with Adina Friedman, the CEO and president of NASDAQ. Um, Adina, thank you so much for joining for this discussion today. I'm really pleased to be here. It's great to see you, Sarah. Right. So um, Adina um, has been at NASDAQ since starting as an intern in 1993, has worked throughout the business um, and left for a few years to Carlisle and then returned and became um, CEO in 2017. She also, very importantly to us, is a member of the board of FCLT Global. So um, again, Adina, thank you for being here. And thank you for your leadership on these issues about the sort of connections between capital markets and, and, the, and the sustainable economy and the, and the important things that we're all trying to achieve. Um, one of the terms that you have, have used in some of your writing is about cooperative capitalism. So can you start by telling us a little about what do you, what do you mean by cooperative capitalism and, and, um, and how does that translate into the way that you're thinking about um, the work you're doing at NASDAQ? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me today, Sarah. It's really a pleasure to speak with you. And, and certainly, I think that the work of FCLT is really important in creating a more sustainable economy going forward. So very pleased to be a part of the organization. Um, what One of the things we've been really focusing on is, is how do we empower companies to consider their, their broader role um, in the communities around them, as well as in helping to solve some of the bigger problems that, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, that the, the global economy really faces, particularly on the back of the current COVID crisis. And we have been able to leverage the fact that the Business Roundtable did come out with a broader purpose statement, which I think has helped open the minds of investors and CEOs to say, okay, we always know that we have to deliver returns to shareholders. You know, that's definitely a, a big part of, of what we do because that will help you know, create wealth creation for millions and millions of people. But we also have a bigger role to play. And when we look at the role we have in our communities around us, in the, the, uh, energy, you know, the energy efficiency that we create for the environment, the social elements of, of what we do and how we behave, all of those things are also very important to creating a sustainable economy, to creating sustainable growth, and ultimately delivering that long-term um, long benefit to our shareholders. So we started to think through that purpose statement, then we saw the effects of COVID and all of the work that companies did back in March and April, like right away, the, the very quick decisions that companies made to convert their manufacturing plants to help create PPE or to leverage their supply chains to be able to bring, for instance, produce from the local produce providers that otherwise, frankly, wouldn't have been sold. Uh, some grocery stores were able to buy that up and deliver those to food banks in the areas that where they serve. Things like that where they were not there to, to look at their very short-term economic interests, but rather, how do we make sure that we help our communities through this crisis that then, of course, supports their employees, it supports the society, and it helps with their economic recovery, which then over the long term will benefit the shareholders of their company. Um, when we thought through all of those elements of what does it take to create a sustainable economy, that sense of cooperative capitalism, cooperating with the government to find ways to solve big problems, cooperating with the communities around them to make it so they can lift the communities up while still delivering for the shareholders. Those are areas that we think are um, a unique opportunity for the private sector to get engaged in solving some of the bigger problems we're facing in a cooperative way while still staying true to who owns them, you know, to their owners. So we want to think through all of those, those opportunities together um, and think about cooperative capitalism as the way forward for our economy. That makes sense. And do you think that this idea has been embraced broadly in a, in a fairly permanent way? Or how do you think about, the, obviously there's a reaction to a crisis and, and people jump in and, and serve food banks and, and so on, but how do we um, make it part of the, the fabric of um, the economy rather than just um, a reaction to a crisis? Well, I think it starts with um, investors embracing the notion 
because at the end of the day, the investors in these companies are their owners. And so when you look at the rise of ESG investing um, and what I'll call purpose oriented investing, impact oriented investing, as well as the broader ESG investing uh, framework, I do think that that has been a huge growth area for the investment professionals, which then gives them a reason to look beyond the immediate quarterly numbers and say, okay, how are you creating a more sustainable future for the company? What are you doing to make sure that you are addressing the needs of employees while still being practical, but still having, uh, looking at the needs of employees, looking at the role you play in the community to make sure you're creating a sustainable community, making sure obviously you're, you're managing your business in an energy efficient way. ESG investors are having and playing a bigger and bigger role in that dialogue. And I think if, and you know, we are seeing that as a sustainable trend. I had, I had some concerns that as the crisis started, that the ESG uh, orientation uh, at, within companies would change because they were dealing with their immediate needs. But the fact is, if anything, it's actually grown in significance within the companies because the social impact and the social inequities that we're now recognizing the need to address in a more formalized way, coupled with a very long-standing focus on the, on the um, environment, and now also this idea of the communities, the social impact we can have in the communities, I think if, if anything, it's been escalated and elevated within the companies and their boards over the last several months. Um, so I personally feel like there's this moment that we have right now where there's an alignment of interest across the investment community and the corporate community. It, I do believe that the majority of CEOs want to have the opportunity to play that role appropriately and to do it in a sustainable way. And now they're hearing more and more from their investors that they want that too. So I do think we have a moment here to kind of shift the narrative while still ultimately recognizing that, you know, profits are a part of our economy. Um, delivering growth and returns are part of what we do, but doing it in a responsible way is the best way to create a sustainable economy. Yeah, I, I know that NASDAQ owns uh, some um, exchanges in the Nordic countries and the Nordics have been um, thought leaders in some of these topics. So are there things that they have done um, differently or have done uh, maybe more quickly than um, people in, in the US or other countries that, um, that we can learn from? Or do we think we're all sort of uh, learning as we go together? I, in general, I think Europe is more mature in the area of ESG investing and the Nordics have certainly led the way there. So, and it's, and it's really interesting to see how ingrained it is across the communities within the Nordics. You know, it's not just a topic for the investment community. It's not even just a topic for the senior ranks within companies. It's every single employee within our Nordic exchanges, every single employee within NASDAQ in the Nordics and, and the companies that they serve have, are asking the question, what are we doing to make it so we have a more sustainable planet? Um, they frankly are very active um, in trying to bring down our footprint as a company, um, as well as uh, supporting their companies through it. They have a much more mature reporting regime in Europe than there is in the United States on areas of ESG. We actually provide them a guide for how to report their ESG progress and their stats. And a lot of our companies have taken us up on using that, um, even though it's voluntary. And the dialogue with investors in Europe is pretty much every meeting you go to, there is a discussion of ESG, the environment, your social responsibility, and your governance as part of an investor meeting. Up until, I would say, 18 months ago in the United States, I probably may have gotten that question in one of 50 meetings. Um, starting about 18 months ago, I would say got to one in 20, then one in 10, now two to three to four in every 10 meetings I'm having with investors, there is some discussion of an element of ESG. So you can feel it bringing, it's really drawing very quickly into the US, but it's on a pretty mature basis in Europe at this point. So you mentioned the issue of uh, metrics and disclosures and um, FCLT has been doing work on how do we get metrics that really make sense for investors um, from the issuers directly, because of course we know that investors will uh, scrape data from all sorts of other places, but that's different than, than issuer disclosed data around some of these um, topics. And sometimes metrics on 
ESG sounds um, mushy or, or fluffy, uh, but I think what we're all trying to do is have it be part of an everyday investment decision. So how are you seeing the companies that are doing this well, really getting that uh, those metrics into that investment conversation rather than having it be two separate conversations like I think it has been historically, which is you know one about real financials and then one about something else, really bringing these two things together. Yeah, I think it's still a journey there, I have to say. Um, we're not finding that, that we're seeing a government mandate in these areas. So then it does really just become a discussion of how do I want to present the company? How do I want to present progress against certain targets? What targets should I be setting? And, and making sure that the investor community is aware of the things that are happening under the covers within companies. Because a lot of times companies are doing interesting things. They are supporting their communities. They're philanthropic. They have a lot of volunteerism. They are reducing their energy footprint, but how do they make sure it gets, it gets known? So one of the things that we do is actually help our companies figure out how best to disclose that and where, right? So right now you're right, there's a proxy. So there's almost three documents that investors really need to digest appropriately. There's the 10K that really is focused on financial disclosures, risk disclosures, and a discussion of what the company does for a living. Very important. A basic document that the government requires. And then there's the proxy. And there are certain elements of the proxy that are required by the government, like compensation disclosures, board composition disclosures. But there are things you can do in the proxy that can really elevate the discussion of ESG. If you want to talk about board diversity, that's the right place to do it. If you want to talk about um, community outreach and philanthropic activities, that's the right place to do it. So the proxy is a second. And then uh, many companies today, particularly I would say mid to large cap companies are putting out a sustainability report, which is historically focused on environmental work that they're doing. But now sustainability has a broader mandate. It is talking about your social impact and governance and how that impacts your sustainability as a company in addition to environment. Those three documents, to, I think, are the way that investors tend to triangulate on getting the information. Now, that makes it hard for investors. So uh, there are some metrics companies that gather up and scrape all this data and try to make sense of it and put it together in a framework. But some do it well and some don't do it as well. Um, some are just doing it electronically, which means they're not trying to understand it. And others try to understand it, but they don't understand in, in industry specific issues. So the more that we can come together as, a, as an organization like FCLT, or there's an, you know, there's several that are trying to standardize that disclosure in a way that's simple to report and simple to process, I think the better the industry will be. But we're at that, like, if you think of a product life cycle, we're at the early stages of a product life cycle, a lot of proliferation of metrics makers and, and, um, and frank standards makers. There's going to be an evening out to find that standard. In the meantime, NASDAQ has actually um, uh, bought a company called One Report, but we've been um, really working with companies to create, you put all your data into one place and we can propagate it out to all of these metrics makers and standards makers as well as ultimately to the investment community directly so that it kind of, it makes it so it's easier for companies. It is a very confusing world for companies right now. Um, and, and it would be nice if we could turn this into something that's more streamlined and make, making it easier for investors also have an apples to apples comparison. So lots of work to be done there. Very early, I would say, in the evolution of this globally. Um, but I also think that we're gonna find that there's a coalescing over time. Yeah, I think there's so much pressure to to get rid of some of the frustration that there is that there that uh, there will be a, a solution over time. So that that's important. Uh, one of the things you mentioned about the proxy is this issue of board diversity, and clearly that's an important issue both for um, for Nasdaq, for companies that are listing on Nasdaq, for um, the growth of the economy. We've done some work, and others have as well, that have shown. Um, the correlation between more diverse boards and better performance in the long term. So that's also a bit of a process and a journey. And can you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about encouraging board diversity um, within the, the, the NASDAQ world? 
Yeah, first of all, I think at NASIC itself, we have been focused on board diversity as part of how we've been evolving our own board. Um, and we've recognized that there is some amazing talent out there that is, uh, we're very fortunate to be able to have, uh, you know, I would say some level of diversity. We still have work to do ourselves, but we, I think that have, have had a focused, uh, focused effort on that. And wow, is there amazing talent out there to be able to, to put onto our board, whether it's gender diversity or ethnic diversity. Um, I, I have to say it's, it's, um, it's, it's been exciting to see how much talent there is available to serve on corporate boards. In terms of our own effort, we have a governance business that we've been developing over many years. We provide um, a leading board portal technology that allows boards all over the world to communicate with each other electronically. Um, but we also have a, a board um, advisory practice. And so we've been developing best practice concepts around board diversity. We strongly encourage disclosure of board diversity in the proxy, and we provide templates on how to do that in a way that's easy for investors to see and read, um, as well as to make sure that people, we do studies on what are the benefits of board diversity, as do you. And so that's another reason why we really do like the, um, the our affiliation with FCLT. I think you guys really do a nice job of doing some very objective work on issues of things like board diversity to say, why does it matter? Uh, and I think that at the end of the day, we've seen progress, but it's slow, um, I have to say. So. Are there ways for us to continue to work with our companies to speed progress along um, in developing a more diverse board structure? I think that there are things that you know we can continue to work on with our with our corporate clients. We also have to be mindful of our role. Uh, we are the ultimate gatekeeper to the public markets. There are two exchanges that really kind of are ultimately there to to be the gate um, to the public markets, and so we take that role very seriously. And we want to make sure we don't raise the bar so high for public companies that they may, we make it too difficult to go public. But at the same time, I think we want to make sure that people recognize there's a standard that we, that we want to have. The last thing I would say is the easiest way to address that is for private companies to start to really focus on board diversity as well. This is not a public company problem. This is a corporate problem. Um, and I personally think that private equity firms actually have an easier time creating diversity on their own portfolio company boards than public companies do because they can tap their own network. You know, they have all of these companies within their portfolio that should have diverse people within the management teams. And what a great opportunity to give per, a, you know, a person on the management team of one company the opportunity to serve on the board of another, to develop their skills, to learn about another part of the industry, and to, to be still within that private equities kind of family of companies. It, it does feel like there's a real opportunity for a private equity to lead the way um, in developing more diversity. And then it makes it so much easier to transition to a public markets because you already have diversity on your boards as opposed to it becoming an issue you have to address upon going public. So those are the things that we've been really focused on to try to promote the idea that this is an important part of the sustainable economy that we wanna create going forward. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and having it backed up into the private market. So um, it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a scramble on the, on the IPO and obviously it will help the companies um, understand trends and, and see risks um, before they, before they get to that uh, point as well. Exactly. Exactly. But you raise an interesting point also about raising the bar in the public markets, which is, you know, obviously the disclosure in the public markets is much higher than in the private markets. Um, there are um, requirements on public companies that are not on private companies. There's, there's often uh, people talking about how hard it is to be a public company. How do we get that right balance between ensuring that the, the public markets um, are the place that people want to be, uh, that, that they aspire to be, and they have that uh, sort of gold standard, um, but also, you know, not, not make it so difficult that, that um, people opt out of the public markets. It is such a fine balance to strike, Sarah, as we know, um, because, okay, so first of all, when a company goes public, why do they have all these extra disclosure obligations? There is a very good reason for that, which is instead of going out and trying to find a very small group of investors, and in, in normally I would say institutional investors, very savvy high net worth individuals, family offices, that's the world of the private markets. That's a pretty narrow universe of investors and the vast majority of them 
are, are you know, well-structured and are well knowledgeable to the extent that they can, they know what they need to know in order to make an informed decision. Well, you go from that world as a private company to the public world where you are now making yourself available to hundreds of millions of investors. Every person in America can open an account at a retail brokerage and buy a public company. Um, those, those investors are, some are very savvy and some are just starting out. And so, and we have the chance, you know, you have to make sure you try to create a symmetry of information. So when a company goes public, the big thing is we've got to disclose, obviously the financials in a way that make them digestible to an average person um, and conform to certain standards so that they're kind of as apples to apples as possible. Then you have to disclose all the risks that the company has in a way that allows investors to make an informed decision. That level of disclosure is very new to most private companies, but it's very important because you know, public investors, retail investors have a right to understand the risks of the businesses that they're investing in. And then on an ongoing basis, you have to make sure that you continue to provide them information that allows them to be informed along the way. It does not create an, in, an inside club where some insiders know certain things and others don't. So there's a very important reason for the disclosure regime that exists in the US and it is the foundation of our public markets. We're very proud of it, but it does come with a burden, which is you have to be very mindful of how you disclose information, where you disclose it, when you disclose it. Um, and if we're not careful, we can raise the bar so high in terms of disclosures that are not necessarily related to financial disclosures, risk disclosures. They might be politically driven disclosures. They might be nice to haves, but not need to haves. That you do raise the bar so high that companies go, why, why am I doing this? Like, why bother? I can go and find plenty of money in the private markets. So we do have to strike that balance. I also think there could be you know, more of an opportunity to work with private companies around certain disclosures so that it doesn't become a big change to go public, but rather that private companies also, particularly like, as we said, around board diversity or things that, that should already be kind of every company should be thinking about, that we could try to, um, to engender across the private and public markets so that it's not, it's not a public company issue, it's, it's a company issue. So I, I think there are things like that. And then the last thing is, the private markets you know, are available to a very narrow set of individuals. And I think that the, the concern around that is, is, the, is the kind of the furthering of the wealth gap. So the wealthy get wealthier and those that don't have the means to invest in those companies because there is a hard bar as to how much wealth you need to have in order to invest in a private company or a private fund, uh, they fall behind, further behind. So, we're not necessarily agreeing with everything that the SEC has put out with, in regards to changing private company investment criteria, but we are pretty supportive of enabling more retail investors to gain access to private equity funds and venture funds, funds that are, that are um, managed by professionals that have to register with the SEC, that have certain disclosure obligations themselves, there should be an opportunity for a broader set of retail to invest in those funds. And we think that's, that will help also create, you know, less of a gap between the private and the public markets. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And in terms of the ability for people to participate in the growth of the economy, it's so important for uh, average people to be able to have that wealth creation opportunity. And clearly, if we dissuade people from being in the public markets, um, then we limit that opportunity because most 401k plans and others um, have a very hard time uh, investing in, in the private markets. They so. do. And, and I think there are a few things you can do. One is you can find ways to make them make those private funds more accessible to 401k vehicles. So that's one way to do it. Um, and one of the key areas there, and, and I am, you know, talking our own book a little bit, is, uh, is the issue of liquidity. So, you know, 401k vehicles have certain requirements for, number one, understanding what the net asset value of a fund is, at, you know, at any given time. And secondly, having access, liquidity, ability to get out, right? <laughs> if you get in, they're only allowed to hold a certain portion of their, their, their portfolio and assets that are liquid. So if you create a more liquid ability for private fund investors to, on a periodic basis, be able to trade out of those funds, 
even if it's a closed end vehicle, meaning you're trading from one investor to another, you're not adding the invest to the ad investor base, but you're just going, that one interest is going from one to the other and transferring that interest. We think that that will ultimately actually make those vehicles more accessible to some of the 401k vehicles. And NASDAQ has something called the NASDAQ alt system that does allow for the transfer of private fund interests um, and in, a, in a way that's highly regulated by the SEC and the IRS. So um, we've gotten special designation to be able to offer that. And it's a price, you know, it's a price formation vehicle that allows for price discovery of private fund interest. So we think that that's one way to handle what you just said. But the other way, and frankly, the bigger way is to make the public markets more accessible and more inviting for companies to go public. And if you think about it, if people wait so long to go public now that they're very large companies by the time they're in the public markets and investors have lost out on the, a lot of that, that growth. Um, and if you think about, you know, the, the best example I think that people use today is, is the fact that Amazon went public when they were worth, I think it was less than $500 billion. Um, and so, and they went public over 20 years ago. And just think of the wealth creation that has come if you, if you bought that stock when they IPO'd and the opportunity for every American or frankly, anyone in the world with an account to be able to be a part of that wealth creation. Yeah, and, and that dispersion of that wealth is so, is, has been so wide, right? People could buy one share or a lot of shares. Right. So you mentioned this issue of um, around the world. Um, clearly the US markets have been in some ways the capital markets for the world. There are many, many foreign companies that are listed here. Some other countries are trying to develop their own. Sometimes there are some political issues about who can list here and who can't. Can you talk about sort of in the long run how you see uh, the role of the U.S. capital markets relative to being that um, capital provider for uh, for companies around the world? Yes. Well, I, I think that we are the U.S. public markets today are the deepest, most liquid, most diverse markets in the world. Um, we're extremely proud of that. We uh, see it as, in a way, it's kind of like the melting pot um, of the markets, right? We, we welcome companies from all over the world to come and tap into the public investor here in the United States. Um, we provide them a very specific disclosure regime that they can operate within, and we then give them access to trillions of dollars of capital available to invest in those companies from all over the world. So we basically propagate global growth um, through the, the, the ability for these companies to come and tap into the U.S. investor. Now, there are U.S. investors who are able to, of, of course, go and invest in, in foreign markets, but it's a much narrower set. So it does, it does not give you the same robust access to investors um, if you are in a, you know, an emerging market economy. Absolutely, the public markets there can, can be very helpful to companies as they're growing and expanding and they get access to a good, a good domestic base of investors with some foreign investors. But of course, when you come to the US, you get a much, much, much broader set of global investors. Um, however, you know, there are political issues that sometimes creep into this situation. Uh, global economic, macroeconomic uh, trends and issues do sometimes creep in. And, and we are seeing that right now with some of the political rhetoric um, um, around Chinese listings. And I think that there has been a regime that's been created here in the U.S. that actually does make it so that companies coming from China, we don't have as much visibility sometimes into the financials um, and of the Chinese companies because of the fact that um, the auditors of certain, certain auditors are, don't always have access to or, or I should say the, the, audit, the regulator for the auditors don't necessarily have access to be able to um, audit the auditors, to be very honest. But I, at the same time, to, what, what we would like to see is that the regulators here in the U.S. and the regulators in China work together to find a way to improve that disclosure regime that then puts the, the Chinese companies in a more level playing field um, here in the U.S. markets, as opposed to saying you can't list here. So there's this a little bit of, um, you know, a political ping ponging around having them not be able to list here versus having the regulators work together to find a solution to make it so that there's a more level playing field. We obviously are in, in uh, support of the latter, <laughs> which is finding ways to solve these problems so that we can continue to be the center of the world for capital raising and, and, and liquidity. 
And, and I think if we don't do it right, then those companies will just continue to list in Hong Kong or China or, or other countries around the world, as it, and the U.S. markets will become a diminished part of the global ecosystem. So it's in our interest to solve this problem, for sure. Yeah, in the long run, it makes sense to have the capital formation and the capital transactions be um, in, a, in a more unified, more liquid, uh, deep place that, that, is, that is well regulated. So um, that is, that is, makes sense from a economic point of view for um, both investors and, and, and companies. Um, so we started out on this sort of a question or context of the current pandemic. Um, and then we've also had, of course, over the last number of months, um, extensive discussions on Black Lives Matter and um, racial equity in this country. Um, one of the challenges that we have seen is that some groups of people are more invested in uh, markets than others, as you mentioned, in terms of um, the dispersion of, of wealth. What do you think that either we as focusing capital in the long term or you as an exchange can do to get those people who have traditionally been um, excluded from markets either um, by, by uh, formal or informal barriers into the financial community, into um, making those sorts of financial decisions, planning their own financial futures, building that wealth um, in the context of, of the, the markets? Well, I think we could be here all day <laughs> because there are a lot of impediments. And I think we have to recognize that there are you know, many societal and structural impediments that we have to overcome. And it's not just the private markets and the private sector, or I should say the public markets and the private sector that are gonna solve that. It's, it's, it's that cooperative capitalism we talked about at the beginning of the call, where the private sector working with the government, how do we create a better chance for equal opportunity in this country um, is a big, big question. And it starts with education, family services, housing, you know, basic services, social justice. So there is a, a lot there to unpack that's in the public sector, but the private sector can be part of the solutions. You know, how do we leverage the fact that we're seeing online learning go from almost nothing to the entire country practically? Now, it's not necessarily being done as well as it could be, but imagine if it could be done well, and we know, we, and we know it can. So how do we bring some of the technologies and innovations we're seeing into the public sector using private sector capabilities and the nimble innovation that the private sector can bring in to solve some of these bigger societal problems. I think that is the foundation of cooperative capitalism. And I do believe that if, if we were open to that and we were really focused on solving bigger problems together between the private sector and the public sector, we could make an enormous, enormous amount of change. Um, so that it really starts there, which is a much bigger issue than the markets. I think the second thing is then access to capital. And so there are so many um, minority-led private companies in, in the United States. In fact, um, there, there are so many companies that are being launched by, by people of color and underrepresented minorities, but they do not, they, they, these numbers are de minimis in terms of how much access they actually have to venture capital and early stage capital and the banking deserts that have really developed in, in this country particularly in smaller cities and towns where they just don't even have access to a bank that where they can lend money appropriately. So that's, a, I think, a second major structural change that we have to make is how do we make sure that the banking universe has more of an incentive that can be government driven, by the way, to, to offer banking services in a more distributed way and to people who have different credit histories. How do we help com you know, individuals improve their credit so that they can get better access to capital? And then how do we make the VC community more accessible to underrepresented minorities? Those are all other structural issues. Now, then you get to the public markets and you say, well, a couple of things. One is pensions, 401k vehicles, public pensions, private pensions. Um, all of those, those pension funds for teachers and for firefighters and for healthcare workers, they're all investing in the public markets. So they actually do propagate equity ownership to over half the population in the United States. And they're very important. Um, and so listening to them and making sure that they can continue to operate successfully in the public markets, getting them access to growth companies, having companies go public sooner, all of those things are helpful. Um, and then lastly, I think that one of the things that we're trying to 
think through is why aren't it used to be for a period of time that many companies would issue equity to their entire employee base so that all of their employees would become owners and they then get the benefit of the wealth creation of being an owner of these companies today it, it has changed and and it was interesting when you look at what what event was the primary cause of that it was a change in the accounting rules that the PCAOB required that had changed the accounting for stock options and stock um, equity compensation within companies that made it much more expensive for companies to issue equity to their employees, which then changed the culture. Um, NASDAQ is proud that the vast majority of our employees do own equity, but we're not, we're, we're, we're definitely in the minority of companies who do that today. So how do we maybe work with the regulations to make it so that there's more of an incentive to turn our employees into owners. And I think that's the, that's the last thing for us to consider as well. Those are, those are very actionable things that we can, that we could work on in a, against a very, a very big problem. Um, so just coming back to um, COVID and that'll be the, uh, we'll wrap up. You wrote a really interesting article um, a couple of months ago about vaccine makers and how, um, how well-funded vaccine makers are a, a good uh, chance for us to solve this problem. Obviously, we don't know when and if we will we'll solve this vaccine problem, but um, can you just talk about how you think about the, the capital markets driving that kind of innovation and how we ensure um, that we leverage um, you know, those, those great ideas that hopefully will uh, we'll come up with a solution for, for this problem? Sure, well, I, I think we all, recognize that there are one of the, the one of the great foundations of our country is our innovative spirit and i think that there are many laws that exist that really support that innovative spirit you could even point to the difference between the bankruptcy laws here in the united states versus europe that give uh, the whole concept of a second chance to an individual here um, that really does allow for people to take risk and try things and be innovative then you also have this whole funding mechanism in terms of private investment, angel investors, you know, VCs leading up, up into the, the public markets. What's interesting about healthcare and particularly biotech is the public markets actually often serve as late stage venture. Um, so you're seeing a lot of biotech companies come to the public markets much faster than tech companies, for instance, and they leverage the public markets actually as late stage venture or you know, pre-revenue late stage venture investing. And so it, it does give rise to this great sense of innovation here in this country. Uh, so what we wrote about in the spring, or I wrote about in the spring, is the fact that COVID uh, is, you know, I, I am an, I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> so it was talking about capital being part of the cure, you know, making sure that we keep the capital markets flowing, active and healthy, so that innovators can come and, and make sure that they can continue to get funded. Um, and allowing investors to make the, take those, ris those risks, knowing that they could be leaning into a major trend. And what we've seen on the back of after March was the first companies that came out into the public markets were biotech companies. Um, and the amount of funding that has gone into biotech, whether it's vaccine related or other, you know, other cures and, and treatments has been really amazing this year, as, as it has been for several years, but it's been a real, it's been so wonderful to see investors putting their money behind great ideas and companies having access to that capital to allow themselves to be part of the part of the cure. Well, and I think your 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 optimism is infectious and it reminds us that you know the reason we have capital markets is to um, fund this sort of innovation and to give savers a way to um, participate in that and to, to to be to be the link between those two. Um, so I just would like to thank you for your leadership, your long-term leadership, your long-term vision, obviously your um, association with uh, FCLT, uh, but your uh, leadership of the, in the markets is, is really inspirational and really trying to understand and push forward what these markets are there for and, and trying to make them work well to serve um, both the savers and the companies in the, in the long term is, is, is inspirational for us. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time. And we look forward to, to having many more of these conversations. Thank you very much, Sarah. It was great. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. Be sure to hit subscribe to get new episodes every other Monday. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.